Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here with all of you today to try to speak something on the Srimad Bhagavatam at the lotus feet of their lordships, Radha Radha Madha, Pajatatva and Nalsimadeva. I seek the blessings of all the devotees so that I can speak on this exalted topic. Okay. So I'll be using this as a whiteboard to write and draw some things. So let's try to understand where we are in the Bhagavatam right now. In the Bhagavatam, we are right now in the third canto, in the second chapter. And this is called Remembrance of Lord Krishna. Now here, the Bhagavatam is often a set of nested conversations. So there is a conversation, for example, between Sutta Goswami and Naimicharini sages. And then, within that, from the second canto starts the conversation between, between Shukadev Goswami and Parikshit Maharaj. And here within that, we have a conversation between, specifically between Uddhava and who is the other person? Vidura. So, here Uddhava and Vidura have met. And Vidura is asking about the well-being of Krishna. So Vidura has been out in the forest for a very long time. And he is, in one sense, unaware of what has happened. And in the meanwhile, Uddhava has witnessed one of the most devastating things that a human being can ever witness. You know, when we have distress, Distress is just a fact of life. That the world is dukkha. Everybody has to face distress. But there are some forms of distress. All distress is painful. But there is some distress which is painful not just for the body or the mind, but even for our very soul. And this is where it is when this happens that our faith can become very easily challenged. And among all the things that a person can witness, he suppose somebody is fight, a soldier fighting in an army. Mm -hmm. Now, if a colleague falls, mm -hmm. if a colleague dies, that's painful. Mm -hmm. But if one's, uh, say, commander dies, mm -hmm. That's even more painful. Because a colleague dying is one loss. Commander dying means the, the army itself may lose direction now. But suppose a commander who is supposed to be very powerful, almost infallible, undefeatable. A commander who is supposed to be undefeatable. Like somebody is so good at uh, sword fighting, that nobody can defeat them in sword fighting. And that person dies in a sword fight only. And the question will come, this is our best sword fighter, and this person has fallen. Then what hope is there for us to ever fight and win? So the extent of the morale being not just shaken, but even shattered, can be overwhelming. So, now, Uddhava, if you consider the scale, Uddhava has similarly experienced something devastating. It is one thing to have his home, Dwarka, devastated. Mm -hmm. It is another thing to have Dwarka Vasis fight and kill themselves. Uh, there is a fratricide among them. And it's worse of all is to see Krishna die by an arrow, a mere arrow of all things. Now, of course, Krishna doesn't die, but he has seen that. It's one thing if we live in a particular city and that city becomes flooded or devastated, there's an earthquake. It's quite shocking. Even, even one part of our home gets cracked, we feel pain. Entire city is raised. It's horrifying. Mm. So, here the whole Dwarka is destroyed. That's bad enough. He saw 
it's one thing everybody dies sooner or later but it's quite another to see people who love each other people whom we love fight like mad and kill each other and then on top of that the person whom we consider to be the lord that lord is felled by an insignificant arrow and that too the arrow is not even shot by any warrior the arrow is shot by whom a hunter a mere hunter and that too the arrow hits merely the leg <coughs> that leg wounds are generally not fatal they are painful but they are not fatal so it's we cannot imagine a situation which can be more challenging or even confounding for one's faith than what uddhava has witnessed so you know prabhupad in some ways witnessed this when the gaudiya math fell apart the gaudiya math had many exalted devotees bhakti sanskar thakur was the founder bhakti sanskar thakur relatively speaking departed somewhat unexpectedly of course according to divine plan but he parted unexpectedly and then after that the devotees who were supposed to be his leaders started fighting among each other and the preaching mission was completely devastated it was prabhu prabhupad sorry prabhupad could have said that this meeting this mission is so pure then uh, why is it falling apart like this it would have been so easy for him just to abandon it and prabhupad was not in one sense very invested in the mission prabhupad was not like a brahmachari or a sanyasi who was dependent on the mission prabhupad was a grahastha and he had his own life and his own career and generally when there are too many problems in something then we feel like, do i need to be ever involved in this i just want to get out of here so like that we see that there are times in our life when our faith will be challenged at its very foundation so any problem can lead us to some sort of negative feeling <coughs> but having negative feelings is one issue many of us when we have some problems in which our temple we are at we may have some question some issues with the local authorities local devotees but still we have our faith in krishna we have faith in the process of bhakti and we continue on and we find our space and continue on but here at the very foundation is krishna really god if he's god how did all this happen to his loved ones how did this happen to him such questions could very easily have afflicted uddhava it could have shaken and shattered his faith and in this series of verses he begins when uddhava asks him so uddhava is asked by whether what happened how is krishna he says the son of our dynasty has departed what welfare can i talk about he is in agony the bhagavatam discusses very poetically and when he hears the words about here he hears questions about krishna it's almost as if he gets lost it's like he gets transported to the spiritual world and he's absorbed and after a few moments he comes back to this world after coming back to this world then he starts speaking so he does describe what has happened but that description is very small oh that that krishna has departed from the world and his focus is on the nectarian remembrance of krishna and he will describe the various past times of krishna and in this particular verse he says that apta kamah lakshmya swaraj lakshmya apta samasta kamah that he has just seen the most unimaginable the most unbearable of misfortune befall everyone including krishna and still his faith is strong they say krishna is the lord of all good fortune he is trayadish trayadish he is the lord of all threes so how is he able to maintain his faith he is talking about the glories of the lord and in one sense 
similar verses glorifying the lord are found repeatedly in the bhagavatam but if we look at the context in which these prayers are being said this is remarkable you know we may say that in the vyasa sarva we may give a class krishna is the supreme controller krishna is the well wisher of everyone but say somebody has extremely painful cancer and they are wasting away and vegetating and they are in a hospital and if at that time they say krishna is the supreme controller krishna is the well wisher of everyone no that requires a lot of faith to say that you know and that will have a much greater impact on us this either this person is just saying it for the sake of saying it but what are they to gain by that they are saying if they sing it with conviction that has a much greater impact shri prabhupad himself had a fairly long prolonged sickness in 1977 and even then he was consistently glorifying krishna by speaking the bhagavatam by talking about talking about krishna with devotees and one of the last purport that he dictated he says krishna is the supreme controller krishna is in charge of everything and that statement has a lot of gravitas a lot of weight because of the context in which is said so that's why you know when you consider the impact of a statement how much impact it has it depends on many things it depends on the content of the statement what is said but also depends on the context of the statement who is saying it when are they saying it so this particular statement this is as i said it can seem to be like a glorification of krishna that occurs so many times in the bhagavatam but in the context in which it is being spoken it is nothing short of utterly extraordinary so how do we maintain such faith if our faith is challenged god forbid such a challenge may never come to our faith to such a degree but at some time or the other the nature of life is events will happen that will challenge our faith the key is buddhi yoga so this is 10.10 in the bhagavad gita buddhi yoga comes several times in the bhagavad gita but let's focus on 10.10 krishna says tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam tadami buddhi yogam tam yena maam upayanti te so the word buddhi yoga has many meanings but one meaning that is relevant for us is the buddhi to do yoga that the intelligence to connect with krishna at whatever be the situation we are in we have to connect with krishna and we have to see that situation in a way that we can connect with krishna and in one sense that is the key responsibility of every devotee that the nature of the world is if i am here you know, there is a spectrum of events that will be happening and some will be positive in the sense that favorable for our devotion some will be negative now if we look at the evidence at the events that are negative we we'll actually start asking where is krishna why is krishna not helping me does krishna even exist but if we look at the events that are positive then i'll explain what positive and negative mean shortly but then we will be able to maintain our faith not only maintain but strengthen our faith if we consider prabhupad's own example let's take three examples we'll start with prabhupad then we'll move towards we'll go to vidura who is a second conversationist here and then we'll come to with uddhava so now prabhupad he met is guru maharaj in 1922 and by that time he was already married he had a child so he said it would be unfair for my wife if i renounce and join the mission for my wife and family so then prabhupad decided that he would work very hard and establish a business and with that business he would fund his guru maharaj mission and some astrologer had said that hmm, he might become one of the wealthiest persons in the country and if you look at prabhupada as a grahastha now he 
is to try his business at three different places. First, he started in Kolkata itself. Then he went to the opposite of the, of the country in Mumbai. Then he went to Prayag. Now I have talked with devotees, who are my friends, devotee scholars, little scholars of history. They said, in 1920s, roughly, at that time mobility was not so much. People would not travel so much, or not certainly not relocate so much. And this is not a small relocation. And nowadays, transporting and relocating people look at from one country to another also. But at that time, to start an entirely new business in another part of the country, if you consider three different parts of the country, east, west, and north. So Prabhupada worked hard, and he was working extremely hard. And his mission his, his, his motive was also pure. It was not just that he wanted to become wealthy and wealthy and uh, enjoy the wealth. He wanted to serve his Guru Maharaj's mission. And what happened? Somehow, every single endeavor was frustrated. Sometimes a fire broke out, sometimes one of his uh, aides uh, cheated and took away the wealth. This happened, the time was wrong. And not one of those endeavors really worked very well. And then at that time, Prabhupada came across that verse. Yasya manugrahanami harishye tadhanam shanai tato adhanam tijatyasya sajana dukkha dukkita that for one on whom Krishna shows special mercy, Krishna takes everything away. Now, most of us when we hear this verse, he says that, you know, I don't want such special mercy. You know? <laughs> In ordinary mercy is good enough for me. <laughs> but the point is that Prabhupada could have been resentful. Why is this happening to me? But Prabhupada saw this verse, Prabhupada talked with his godbrother Sridhar Maharaj and he said, yes, yes, Abhay Babu, this, this seems to apply to you. And Prabhupada took that as an opportunity to shift his focus from building a business to direct preaching. And there also it was not that success came immediately. Success came later. So, but the point was, when there were setbacks, hmm, there were setbacks and severe setbacks, but Prabhupada, for him, that did not lead to dejection. <coughs> From the setback, there was a comeback. Hmm. How did Prabhupada come back? He tried something else. And he was possible to do that because he maintained his faith in Krishna. So, the point is that Prabhupada was able to see the adversity that he was going through in devotionally favorable terms. And Prabhupada uses the word, he said, we should all surrender to Krishna. And yes, it is surrender to Krishna, but Sharanagati, that there are six limbs of Sharanagati, the first two and the last four. Anukulya se sankalpa, pratikulya se varjanam, rakshishtiti vishwaso, goptrutve varanantata, atmanikshe pakarpanne, shadvidaha sharanagati. Now, the last four in this are dispositions. Or oh, the faith that Krishna is the protector, Krishna is the maintainer, Atmanik ship, that feeling that one is worthless without Krishna, or offering one's complete being to Krishna. These are dispositions. They will take time to develop. We can't suddenly one day wake up and feel, yeah, Krishna is my protector. You know, we say Krishna is my protector and no protection. They say, Krishna, where are you? <laughs> After some the question will come. So it's not that simple. But the first two are decisions. And accept what is favorable and avoid what is unfavorable. And that means surrender is not just like passive. Krishna, I raise my hands and surrender. Surrender is dynamic, it's active. In every situation, when we have to surrender, we have to see what is favorable for Krishna, for my Krishna consciousness and choose that. And what is unfavorable for my Krishna consciousness, I need to avoid that. So for example, if we are sitting in a class, maybe the person sitting next to us is just talking on phone. And they're distracting us. Then surrender doesn't mean, okay, whatever Krishna wants, let it happen. Krishna doesn't want me to hear this class. No, <laughs> that's not the point of surrender, isn't it? Surrender means what is favorable for me? If I come here for what is favorable for my devotion, and okay, I should actually hear the class. Maybe I request that person to go out, or if that person is not likely to listen to me, then I move somewhere else. So surrender is that not just active, these two decisions, you could say they are active, 
not passive. In fact, we can also say it's proactive. Proactive means we should be evaluating what is favorable and what is unfavorable. <coughs> so, in the world, so the point I'm making is Prabhupada could have seen that everything is going wrong. And that means Krishna doesn't want me to preach. Why should I preach? The Prabhupada saw it as Krishna wants me to preach in a different way. By not getting into involved in so much in money, but focusing directly on direct preaching. So similarly, if we consider Vidura himself. Now Vidura has also just subjected to a great failure. See, Vidura tried lifelong to try to persuade Dhritarashtra to stop antagonizing the Pandavas, to stop pandering to Duryodhan. And there was always some hope that Dhritarashtra might listen. But Dhritarashtra was too attached to Duryodhan. So if we consider Vidura, Vidura was virtuous, Dhritarashtra was attached, so he was weak. And then there's Duryodhan. Duryodhan was outright evil, vicious. So Vidura had a relationship with Dhritarashtra, but Dhritarashtra had a relationship with Duryodhana, which happened to be much stronger. And after trying lifelong, finally what had happened was Duryodhan had publicly, in the presence of Dhritarashtra, viciously insulted Vidura. And at that time, what happened? With Dhritarash, Duryodhana's words did not hurt him very much. But it was Dhritarashtra's silence that hurt Vidura much more. See, in a conflict, the harshest words of our critics don't hurt us as much as the silence of our friends. Mm -hmm. Now, if we see the situation here, it's like Vidura and Dhritarashtra in one generation. And Duryodhana is another generation. So generally, with our elders, we should be very polite and respectful, as much as possible. So imagine if there are two spiritual masters, and there's one spiritual master's disciple. I'm just deliberately giving a provocative example. Hopefully such a thing never happens in real life. But just to understand the gravity of the injury. Say that the disciple of one spiritual master viciously criticizes another spiritual master. Now, in the presence of that spiritual master, that means that Shishya is criticizing the godbrother of his guru. And now, okay, somebody doing like that is bad enough. <coughs> but if this godbrother sees that the other spiritual master, the person who is the authority figure of the disciple, that person also remains silent. You know, okay, this person might be immature, that kind of behavior is terrible, but it can be overlooked. But your silence, it's much more difficult to overlook that, isn't it? This is what sometimes Prabhupada had to endure um, when he br brought the Krishna consciousness to to Vrindav, to, to Mayapur, that apart. The point is, Vidura could have said, all my life's efforts are wasted. I invested so much time in this Dhritarashtra and he can't even speak one word in support of me. What is the use of my entire life? But Vidura saw it differently. Vidura saw that while Duryodhan's words are spoken because of his envy, because of his arrogance, he was clearly under Mahamaya. But Vidura saw that through his words, Yogamaya is acting. And I am getting a reason to no longer have to stick by Dhritarashtra's side. Because if he had stuck by Dhritarashtra's side, then he would have had to fight against the Pandavas. So, Vidura saw the same words, not as, oh, it shows the waste of my entire life's efforts. He saw it as, actually, this is an opportunity for me to become disentangled from this war. So, again, this is buddhi yoga, the buddhi to do yoga. Vidura's vision of being insulted by Duryodhan. So this is something which we will see all the time. My life's efforts are wasted. 
he could have seen like that but he did not instead what do you see this is this gives me a reason for disentangling myself from the war so this is something which all of us need to do that whatever situation comes in our life it is our responsibility to see it in a way that is favorable for our devotion so this is buddhi yoga now what is if we consider here uddhava himself what is he doing he is remembering so he could have remembered the departure of krishna and that would have been very painful and challenging for the faith but he is remembering the past times of krishna the past times of krishna and the position of krishna throughout his life and by remembering this this is favorable for his devotion so this is buddhi yoga now does this mean that if there are problems we just don't look at the problems no it's not like that it's not, uddhava is not denying that sorry uddhava is not denying that krishna has departed from the world but uddhava is not focusing on that yes however krishna may have departed krishna still remains the lord and it is on his divinity it is on his divine position that i am going to focus and he is remembering the lord's past times so now jiva goswami in the sandarbhas explains the past times like the departure of krishna are what is called as asur mohan leela asur mohan leela means that these are past times meant to delude those who are those who are atheistic those who are demoniac now we say why would krishna want to delude the demoniac krishna does not krishna want to enlighten everyone yes krishna does want to enlighten everyone but krishna is also reciprocating with everyone's desires so nityo nityanam chetna chetnanam eko bahuna yo vidhati kama so eko bahunam yo vidhati kama means that that one lord is maintaining everyone now that maintenance is not just in terms of the bodies that krishna is providing people food water air in spite of whether they are theist or non theist that is, krishna is the maintainer but he is the maintainer not just in terms of bodily needs but he is also the maintainer in terms of beliefs if somebody wants to believe something krishna will give you that person reasons to believe that thing so when talking about the devata and the worship of the devatas krishna says that that yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta shraddha architu michyati tasya tasya achalam shraddham tam eva vidham yaham so he says if somebody wants to worship the devatas then krishna says in 721 i make their faith strong if that's what you want to believe that's what you can believe i'll give you reasons i will direct you to the scriptures of the goddess or the scriptures glorifying shiva glorifying this person or that person in that way your faith will become strong so this is the key principle strength of faith is not necessarily equivalent to the correctness of faith hmm somebody may have a very strong faith because they have that strong desire krishna gives them faith in that particular thing but just because their faith is strong does not necessarily mean their faith is correct because krishna is matta smritir gyanam apohanam cha krishna reciprocates with our desires and if somebody has a strong desire to believe something that is what krishna will guide them towards so if we consider say atheism now if we look at the world around us there is so such extraordinary evidence of so much intricate <coughs> coordination and harmony in the world 
it's almost impossible for any rational person to think that all this could come without any organizing principle. Now, if you consider something simple as clouds. Now, clouds are actually remarkable technology. Clouds are like mobile, airborne, and aircraft proof water tanks. Isn't it? They are airborne. Now, even with the best of technology, we don't have anything like this. Uh, the twin tower designers couldn't make it aircraft proof. So, clouds are a miracle of nature and they are necessary for our sustenance of life. And it's an extraordinary arrangement by which water from the oceans or the water bodies comes to the land masses and nourishes all living things. Annad bhavanti bhutani parjanyad annasambhava. It's parjanya, through rains it happens. Now, atheists will argue if rains are arranged by God through the clouds to provide humans or to provide living beings water, then why does it rain on the oceans? Yes, it rains on the oceans so that atheists can ask questions like this. <laughs> <laughs> So, it's, if that is the evidence you want to focus on, there will be evidence for you to focus on. Like, you come to a building with 100 homes, hmm? and, sorry, building with 100 rooms, and 99 rooms are very clean and tidy, and one room is untidy. They can either look at all the 99 rooms that are clean and think, there must be some, some person who is in charge of this room, somebody is maintaining this house. Or you can look at that one room which is untidy and say that nobody is maintaining this house. It depends on us. So, sometimes I was in America, I was giving a class, college student asked me, why do bad things happen to good people? So I said, why should bad things not happen to good people? He said, what do you mean? He said, no, good things should happen to good people. Why do bad, why and bad things should happen to bad people? He says, why? If there is no organizing principle, if there is no God, then why should there be any correlation between the actions that we do and the results that we get? Isn't it? This question itself presumes an organizing principle. And this question troubles us. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because we do generally see a pattern. That if, say, suppose somebody eats healthy, their health will be better. Somebody eats unhealthy, their health will get spoiled. If somebody smokes and drinks and indulges in all kinds of pleasures, they, they have unhealthy habits, they will go down towards the poor health. So now there will be exceptions. Somebody smokes and they get lung cancer. Yes, that, is, that happens most of the times. But somebody may smoke and not get lung cancer. And somebody may not smoke and get lung cancer. So there are exceptions, no doubt. But why are these exceptions there? The exceptions serve as excuses. Excuses for those who don't want to accept reality. For deniers. So, yes, some people may not smoke and still get lung cancer. Does that justify smoking? No, still smoking is harmful. So, this is, even in, we see this principle throughout existence. That if somebody wants to deny reality, they will find reasons for denying reality. Even fundamental operational reality. That, see, when smoking... Uh, when it initially in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, smoking was considered very fashionable. And all movie stars used to smoke. And then it became more and more clear that smoking was associated with cancer and other diseases. So then what happened was there are several of the smoking companies, they funded some highly influential scientists and they did research and they said actually smoking is not the cause of cancer. They said, actually there is some unknown gene. And this gene makes people smoke and this gene may cause us cancer. <laughs> now, nobody found this gene basically. But that was their theory. That is why? Because they are funded by the scientists. So Einstein said, science is a wonderful thing as long as you don't have to earn money from it. <laughs> So, this is not to criticize scientists, this is the point is that if somebody wants to deny something, you can come up with a lot of reasons for denying those things. So similarly, the, here, each one of us, 
when we face situations in our life, we can look at our own life and it's up to us to decide what evidence am I going to focus on. I could say, oh, there are so many things going wrong in my life. This relationship is not working and this person is like this and my health is going down. My finances are problems. My service is not being appreciated. Yes, all those may be true. And we could look at that and we could say, this Krishna Bhakti doesn't work. This Krishna consciousness doesn't work. Or we could look at the big picture of our life. When we come to places like Mayapur, we see hundreds and thousands of devotees for the morning program. It's so inspiring to see. If most of the other places we go, there are not so many devotees. So, actually every person here is special, is fortunate, is blessed. If we look at our own lives, the chances that we would have come to Krishna are actually infinitesimal. You know, some of the Prabhupada's disciples and some of the stalwart leaders of our movement, but they were already great seekers of God. They went out searching for God, maybe going across the country, across the world to find God. Now, as far as I was concerned, I didn't go out searching for God. You know, God's devotees came out searching for me. <laughs> Isn't it? So, even when we were not practicing bhakti, when we were not interested in God or in bhakti, still Krishna came to our lives. And Krishna gave us an opportunity to practice bhakti. So, if I consider my life journey, I am here right now. And I may have some big problems right now. We are not denying the reality or the gravity of the problems. See me there. Either I can, I can see we, we have this capacity, we can abstract ourselves. That means if I am here, I can visualize that I am above this situation and I can evaluate, look at myself. So, I can either look at this situation and lose faith. Or, I can look back at my life and the fact that many times even without our desire, without our searching, we were brought to Krishna, we were taken ahead in our journey toward Krishna and that can help us gain faith. Krishna has not brought us this far to abandon us now. If Krishna had wanted to abandon us, why would he have even brought us this far? We look at our own life journey, so many things could have gone wrong. And yes, many things have gone wrong, but the very fact that we are alive means that there is more right than wrong in our life. Mm. And the fact that we are still within the association of devotees, still practicing bhakti, suggests that there is definitely much more right than wrong. So this the buddhi yoga, how does it come? It is not just by being creative in our intelligence. The key is bhajatam priti purvakam. When we are practicing bhakti affectionately, then Krishna, I am grateful for the opportunity to serve you. Krishna, I am grateful that I have an opportunity to chant, I have the opportunity to associate with devotees. When we have that priti purvakam, that we may not have ecstasy right now, but we all can have gratitude. And even if we have this gratitude, then Krishna will see that and Krishna will give us the intelligence by which we can come to Him. So, our part is keep that grateful consciousness. So, we can't always be, when you talk about gratitude, you know, it's very difficult to be grateful for all situations. Because some situations are really difficult. It's not really easy. But we can be grateful in all situations. When there are problems, there is no evidence that Draupadi was grateful that Dushasan tried to disrobe her. It would be inhuman to expect her to be grateful for that. But she was grateful that Krishna was still her lord, that Krishna had intervened, that her husbands were there with her. The forest, not she was constantly burning with resentment. So, sometimes the situation we are in is so difficult that it's very difficult to be grateful for that situation. But if we don't reduce our vision of life to our present situation, we look at the big picture of our life, we'll find that each one of us has a lot to be grateful for. And if so, even if we can't be grateful for all situations, we can be grateful in all situations by looking beyond that situation. And by that gratitude, will attract Krishna's mercy. And that mercy will come in the form of buddhi yoga, the intelligence by which we can 
come closer to Krishna even through that difficult situation. So I'll summarize. I spoke three main points today. First, I spoke about distresses and how the most challenging distresses are those which are faith damaging. Mm -hmm. So Uddhava's predicament was like seeing not just a soldier, a colleague die, a commander die, but one supreme commander who is supposed to be like a top sword fighter diving in sword fight. So Dwarka was devastated. The Dwarka was divided the fire fratricidal fight among themselves, and Krishna also departed. So it would have been so easy to lose faith. We discussed similarly with Sri Prabhupada also when his guru, when his mission, his spiritual master's mission, didn't it disintegrated. So this can be an extremely difficult uh, situation. And then we discussed that at such times we need buddhi yoga. So buddhi yoga is the intelligence to the buddhi to come to Krishna. So that requires us to use our intelligence in a way to bring a devotional reading of the situation. So I took three examples. Like how Prabhupada saw his business setbacks as Yasyaha Manugrahanami. Then Vidura, how he saw Duryodhana's insult as an opportunity to disentangle himself from the world. How Neuddhava, he saw that rather than focusing on Krishna, Krishna's departure, he focused on Krishna's, uh, Krishna's past times throughout his life. So when we say surrender, it is active, proactive, where we use our intelligence to focus on the positive. So, we discussed how last point was that the evidence of the universe, if we want, we can have faith, we want, we can lose faith. I discussed the example of clouds, we can discuss example of our own lives. Now we can look at all that is wrong in our life at present and lose faith or we can look at the big picture and see how there is so much more right in our life. So which evidence do we choose to focus on? It's our choice of focus, of what our focus will be. And then the la in, this, in this connection, I discuss one last point is that when we choose to be grateful, it's, diffi it's difficult to be grateful for all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. Then we will get, by Krishna's mercy, the Buddhi Yoga, the devotional insight by which we can maintain our faith and come closer to Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Does anyone have one question? Yes, Mataji. Thank you for a brilliant class on affirmative psychology. This is a really wonderful counseling session for all of us. So I'm very grateful for this. My question is about exactly what you said. When our faith is shaken, when we find that those in authority, leaders, who are supposed to be exemplary in behavior, a huge scandal breaks out and you realize so many children have been traumatized, so many children have committed suicide. And then the silence of those who should speak for the victims is much more painful than what has happened. I mean, that's also painful. But those who should now make amends, or those who should speak in favor of justice, when they keep silent, what are we, the next generation, supposed to do? If you can kindly enlighten. Thank you. Yes. It's a very difficult situation to be in when we see something going wrong around the world and not something like children being abused and it's not being fixed or action not being taken. Prabhupada writes in the seventh canto, one of the purports that 
one should always keep oneself healthy and stout in mind and intelligence to distinguish the goal of life from a life full of problems so that means say if i am here you know, there will be hundreds of things wrong around me hmm? one thing wrong is my drawing also so please excuse me for that <laughs> but there's a say life full of problems hmm? so prabhupad says we need to be clear we should be able to distinguish the goal of life from a life full of problems so if we say this is krishna and this is the goal of life now how can i move toward krishna there are so many problems in the world we cannot fix all of them now does that mean we just neglect the world no not definitely that's not what i'm saying that we have to see what is my service in this situation so generally there is guna and karma this applies for varna ashram for determining varna determining our varna but this can also in general apply for for us to decide whether i want to take up a particular responsibility i want to fight a particular battle or not so you could say guna broadly refers to the disposition and karma refers to the position we are in by which we can do that particular activity so generally speaking you know reform can happen if you look at broad institutional history we look at gaudiya history also reform can happen from inside it can happen from outside hmm or it can happen on the margin so what does that mean if you look at when the gaudiya math broke apart prabhupad did not enter into gaudiya math to try to reform it hmm prabhupad created a new system that is he created gaudiya vaishnavism but that was from outside hmm now if you look at bhaktivinod thakur bhaktivinod thakur he was born in the shakta family and he was introduced to gaudiya vaishnavism a little later and then what did he do you know actually even before he had taken initiation he had already written several books on gaudiya vaishnavism and he was influencing the bhadraloka the educated elite uh, class of of bengalis at that time but then he recognized that he, if his words are to have a greater impact now he took initiation from a person who was considered respectable in the gaudiya community at that time although whether that person was really that exemplary is open to question he took formal initiation from him and then he got credibility because of his initiation connection with the gaudiya vaishnava community also <coughs> and then by that his literature was more widely accepted not just by outsiders of the gaudiya vaishnava community but also insiders so bhaktivinod thakur worked from inside he was an outsider he came inside and from inside he worked for reformation if we consider what bhaktisanth thakur did now bhaktisanth thakur more or less he worked on the margin that means the same person from whom bhaktino thakur had taken initiation bhaktino thakur challenged him in a debate the famous brahmana versus vaishnava debate the person on the opposite side was the guru of was the diksha guru the initiating spiritual master of bhaktino thakur so what bhaktino thakur did was he challenged the strangle hold that the caste goswamis had on gaudiya vaishnavism so he worked on he didn't really seek their approval authority he rather created the gaudiya math which is not completely going outside he was a follower of bhaktino thakur but he worked on the margins so each one of us has to decide you know how we can be a part of the change so some people may say i just don't want to do anything with this now prabhupad didn't generally recommend that prabhupad said whatever be the problems with our movement you stay inside and try to reform and we see that the service if we say of service to krishna is like a relay race in a relay race what happens is each person has to take the torch from say here or a particular distance 
the next person takes the torch over the remaining distance so like that maybe it is our our responsibility is to do some service but maybe the results are not going to come in our lifetime mm -hmm. but so like we know when the ganga was brought to the earth the jalangi over here many many kings performed austerities for their entire lifetime and finally it was one king who brought the earth to the, uh, brought the ganga to the earth who was that bhagirath so bhagirathi ganga is known as but he gets the credit he is the person who takes it across the finishing line but that doesn't mean the efforts of everyone else were forgotten is the world may not recognize them but krishna recognizes them so no so we have to each of us has to decide according to our guna and karma according to our disposition and position how much do we want to fight a particular battle there are many things which need to be fixed and prabhupad's general mood was instead of expect prabhupad did not wait for the gaudiyamat leadership to change prabhupad himself became the change and it's, it's significant prabhupad did not go about criticizing the gaudiyamat leadership also it was only later when they tried to take prabhupad's disciples away and confuse them then prabhupad spoke a little strongly about them but even then prabhupad was maintained respectfulness so so the point is that we all have a particular capacity right now and we all work according to that capacity so yes anybody who has suffered been traumatized it's horrible we pray that they recover from it and that something like that never happens at the same time you know we shouldn't let what is happening in the moment come between us and krishna we have to make sure that we are moving toward krishna and while moving toward krishna we can see how much we can fix sometimes fixing things can become such a mission such a fixation with us that that in fixing things we may we may not stay fixed in krishna ourselves mm -hmm. we may go away from krishna mm -hmm. so then that is not healthy i hope that provides some pointers uh yeah that's very helpful so what i am hearing is find your mission within the mission and focus on that yes good thank perfect you. perfect thank you it's like prabhupad has this huge umbrella you can say that's a krishna conscious movement and within that we can pick our small umbrella and then try to make sure that we hold it aloft okay thank you yes so there was one question here behind we'll stop with this Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prajee, for the wonderful class. Uh, so, Prajee, this verse that you were telling, Vajatam Priti Purvakam and Dadami Buddhi, this two part, what is this Buddhi Yoga is exactly uh, when, means something when we come closer to Krishna, that only does it mean Buddhi Yoga, ke we would come closer to Krishna. And Vajatam Priti Purvakam, in simple terms, what is the definition of Vajatam Priti Purvakam? It's a simply following what the prabhupada has given or something beyond uh, vajatam priti purvakam becomes see words have multiple meanings now buddhi yoga krishna himself uses it differently the three meanings if you look at 239 esha te abhita sanke buddhir yoge to imam shuna buddhya yukto yaya partha karma bandhan prahasya si so the so same term buddhi yoga is used buddhi yoga here in 239 it basically refers to applying atma gyan because krishna has said i have told you atma gyan now i will tell you how to apply atma gyan and then what he describes afterward is karma yoga he doesn't really describe bhakti yoga in the second chapter much so you could say buddhi to practice yoga so the buddhi there is the atma gyan the yoga there is karma yoga hmm? so that is in the second chapter but in the verse that we discussed 10.10 the whole context is devotional jatu shloki bhagavad gita and then there dadami vajita dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upayantite so we have to look at the context of the word to understand their meanings so that's buddhi to do yoga it can be different yogas also it can be the buddhi can be different based on different realities but in 10.10 it refers to the buddhi that krishna is our well wisher by which the yoga is i want to go to closer to krishna in whatever situation i am in so we are focusing on that meaning in 10.10 mm -hmm. now 
Bhajitam Preeti Purvakam Does it mean simply doing what Shri Prabhupada said? Yes, definitely. But you know, Prabhupada said many things. For example, Prabhupada said chant and be happy. Now, this is what? Now you could call this as one instruction. Chant and be happy. Chant and you will be happy. But you could also consider them as two instructions. Now chant and be as happy as is possible in this world. Practice happiness as an austerity. Hmm? So, even when we are chanting, we will have reasons to be unhappy. Hmm? We can always find reasons to be unhappy. But then, try to be happy. <coughs> the last verse in the Dharma series, 1 to 22 in the Bhagavatam is, Atavai kavayo nityam bhaktim paramayamuda vasudeve bhagwati kurvanti atma prasadinim. What that means is, that therefore, Atavai kavayo nityam, the wise people practice Bhaktim Paramayamuda, the process that gives great joy, Paramayamuda, unto whom Vasudeva Bhagavati, Kurvanti Atma Prasadinim, the process which, which gives great joy, they practice with great joy. As I am just putting the translation in a slightly striking way to register the point. So is it that the process gives joy or do we practice with the joy? Well, it is both. It's like, suppose somebody is sick. And after a long time, they have found a cure. Now they have found a cure, but that doesn't mean they are cured. Now we could say they will be cured in due course. So while they are not yet cured, they may still have some pain. But they can be happy that at least a cure has been found. Isn't it? So otherwise, they may not have the cure, but they can be resentful, I am not yet cured, I am not yet cured. So chant and be happy means, yes, when we chant, when we remember Krishna, when we become Krishna conscious, we will ultimately become happy. But till that time, we can chant and strive to be happy. That I am grateful that I have the opportunity to chant. I am grateful that I have the opportunity to practice bhakti. So. Uh, Prabhupada says, Boro Krupa Koile Krishna Adhamera Prati. When Prabhupada came to America, he on the American coastline, when he's seeing that, he's saying, Krishna, you have been immensely merciful to me. Now, we say, what is the mercy? Prabhupada is all alone, he has no money, he has no followers, he has no institutional support. The only resource that he had, that is his own body, <coughs> that has been struck by two heart attacks. What is there to be grateful for? So, Prabhupada on Jaladuta, what is he? He is saying, Krishna, you are so merciful. So, you know, for we can have the facility for a service. Now, Prabhupada had zero facility for service. But Prabhupada was focusing on the opportunity for service. That, at the fag end of my life, at least I have the opportunity to come to the West. My Guru Maharaj wanted me to do that. I have come here. And I am grateful for that opportunity. So, Prabhupada was himself, like, chant and be happy, Prabhupada is demonstrating that. He is happy, although he could have seen all that is wrong in his life and felt nothing is going to work. Oh, he goes, At least I have the opportunity. And he is grateful for that. So, that's what we should try to do also. Okay? So, thank you very much. Granthraj, Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki.